forms. One is replication. You, you can replicate something at a higher level. So for example, in some systems, you have multiple copies of the processor chip. So you are replicating something at a higher level. Or you could uh, uh, have redundancy at a lower level. When you use encoding, you use a few extra bits. Uh, perhaps for uh, parity checking for, for error uh, correction. In that case, uh, that it is a low level redundancy, but that it uses extra hardware, so we call it hardware or spatial redundancy. And then we have uh, time redundancy, or we can call it temporal. So, um, Sometimes you simply try something again and the next time it will work. Doesn't work all the time, but for a lot of problems they go away. And after a while things get good, come back to normal. So uh, we, will, uh, we are going to look at the mechanism, roll back and retry, which is a well known uh, strategy. Basically the idea is that time to time you keep on saving the state of the system. So for example, uh, in the uh, systems administrators, every night they will take a dump of the uh, systems. And uh, so if somebody loses some files during the day, at night they can restore that file. So um, rollback is uh, rolling back to a state that has been saved. And retry means uh, trying the computation again after a state has been reestablished. And that is a good example of uh, time redundancy, a very common example. It is used at many different levels. Encoding is another example. Notice encoding could, uh, so you can use some extra bits in terms of space. So you have a few bits here, then you have maybe a couple more extra bits here. Or you can have encoding, so information is uh, transmitted in serial, and then you have a couple of extra bits that come in uh, after the other bits. And in that case, they take extra time, they don't take extra hardware, they don't take extra wires, but they do take extra time. Retransmission in networks, automatic repeat uh, request, uh, how many of you are familiar with this? So if you have uh, taken a course in uh, data communications, so you are familiar with this. And that's uh, an example of time redundancy. So after some something that indicates that a packet did not uh, go through, you uh, transmit the packet. And that's an example of time redundancy. And then there is the procedural redundancy. Okay, so there's a problem, there could be a problem that is limited by hard space. There's some pro there could be some problems that are limited in terms of number of times. Now these have to do with uh, procedures or step-by-step -step things. So sometimes uh, you uh, incorporate something that involves some kind of checking. Uh, which will require some small overhead. In software, you can have redundancy. So you can have, um, uh, you are doing some calculation and you calculated something and the result somehow looks suspicious. You uh, go to another version of the software and try it again. And sometimes you can even take a vote. That is referred to as a software uh, redundancy. This is a, a controversial subject, and we will see why it is uh, controversial. Uh, of course, for software redundancy, if it is the same software, then that will not uh, uh, solve the problem because if the bug is there in the software, and the bug is going to be there again. So you have to have separately written versions of the software in this case. Verifying a design is also an example of procedural redundancy. Basically, uh, you have some problems in the procedure 
and you verify, you do your design and verify your design. That is an example of uh, procedural redundancy. Now these are uh, the most common examples of redundancy that you will find in uh, the books. But I was thinking about redundancy and I thought that there are actually a couple of other types of uh, redundancies that uh, could be considered separately. One of them is analog redundancy, use of uh, some slack or margin. Now in this case, you are using some analog quantity. So for example, let us say you are building a um, building and you have some columns there and you make the columns a little wider that uh, just to allow for some uh, uh, margin. Or if you are uh, uh, designing some chips and you are trying to uh, make chips work at a certain clock frequency, uh, you may want to uh, add some, allow for some extra delay in case if temperature rises then propagation delays would increase in the chip and you have to make sure that you allow for that. And uh, those, those are examples of analog redundancy. And then some people uh, talk about information redundancy. So you have data and you have uh, some redundancy in the data itself. Now that sort of has been covered already because redundancy in data is either takes uh, more space, for example if you have a bus and you have an ex extra parity bit, or if you have a RAID system uh, where you have multiple disks, then you have um, uh, 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 several of them you have several disks, then uh, that is an example of information redundancy which uses extra hardware. On the other hand, information redundancy could be temporal. So for example, when you send a packet through uh, the internet, uh, you have the CRC at the end which is basically redundant but uh, you have it there for checking purposes. So that is an example of temporal redundancy. Now exactly, uh, exact classification is sometimes hard because sometimes you can classify a redundancy either as one type or other type. Um, is redundancy good or is it bad? So far, I've been saying that redundancy is good, right? But redundancy can also be bad. Uh, one obvious disadvantage of a redundancy is that uh, you have uh, overhead. Sometimes that could be significant. Redundancy can make it difficult uh, to uh, achieve a good uh, testing coverage. And we'll talk about this later. Because if something is redundant, false, or masked, but when you're testing, you want to test, you want to find the false. If you have redundancy that is not managed, and if it is excessive, then actually it can decrease reliability. So we will see later on that there is actually a trade-off that after a certain amount of redundancy, uh, it uh, stops being of any added value, it can actually become a burden. So in general, if your uh, redundancy is unmanaged, but if it is excessive, it can actually uh, hurt the reliability. Now we are going to have a, uh, an assignment on redundancy, and let me formulate the assignment and I will uh, have it uh, available uh, I guess uh, next time and I will let you uh, give you a week to work on it. So this, this is going to be, uh, you have to find some examples of redundancy. 
then you have to find what kind of redundancy it is. And just to make it interesting, uh, maybe I will exclude redundancy in computer systems. That's what we are going to do anyway. So you have to find some examples from other systems. But let me formulate the assignment and I will have it uh, uh, available uh, by uh, next time. Any questions on redundancy? Okay, there are uh, two approaches we are going to take in this class. Uh, some approaches are deterministic and some approaches are probabilistic. Uh, how many of you uh, uh, like theory of probability? <coughs> how many of you don't like theory of probability? Okay, so um, now there's a, a, a theory of probability, it, it requires kind of a philosophical inclination. So it, it would be a nice if we always knew exactly where we are. So is this good or it is, is it bad? And sometimes you want, uh, you want to get a yes or no answer. And that is a deterministic approach. But you want to uh, test for something, you apply some uh, methods, and if it is there, you find it, and uh, um, basically the approach is deterministic. But the thing is that the real life is uh, made harder by the fact that we don't always know everything. In fact, the truth is that at any given time, there would be a significant amount of information that is not available to us. And even in that situation, you have to make a decision. So for example, let us say you are thinking of buying a house. So should you buy a house or should you buy a house maybe after five months? And if you buy a house, are you going to make money on it or uh, lose money? Uh, any of you uh, own a house? So uh, maybe eventually, I guess eventually you will. So, um, and the thing is that it's really probabilistic. Now with houses, of course, there's a reasonable certainty that after some ups and downs, uh, your house is probably never going to be worth nothing except when you are living in California and your house is on a, uh, one of the places where they tend to have uh, landslides or your house simply slides down the uh, uh, cliff and you don't even have the land, it's all gone. So, but other than that, uh, but even then there's considerable uncertainty and of course the recent financial crisis, it, it occurred because uh, people didn't know that uh, well, uh, um, so a lot of times you don't know the exact uh, details. For example, let's say you are an insurance company, then um, you want to. Uh, 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 cover a person, he buys life insurance, so how much premium you should charge. And of course you don't exactly know when the person is going to die or when he's going to get sick. But based on some data, you have some data and based on that you have you can make some decisions. And so those are the probabilistic approaches. So in this course we will sometimes use deterministic approaches and sometimes we will use probabilistic approaches and they are both valid approaches and even though it would be nice for us to know this uh, a lot of times there is no choice but to use probabilistic approaches in fact that is what makes this field uh, challenging and uh, when we will talk about testing, 
we will uh, 